Turkey's main stock exchange halted trading on Friday when the circuit breakers kicked in after the main index fell 5%. After trading resumed, the benchmark index was more than 8% lower. Turkey's stock market has been, up until now, a safe haven from the chaos engulfing the country. Investors were willing to own stocks, betting that a weaker lira would be good for exporters. Even after Friday's fall, the Turkish stock market is still up by more than 40% this year, in local currency terms. That sounds good, but in dollar terms, it's fallen by 36%. This sell-off came as the Turkish lira fell a further 7% to a new all-time low on Friday, a day after the central bank again lowered interest rates, despite a reported annual inflation rate of more than 20%. This morning, it's continued its collapse, down an additional 6%. Usually when researching a topic like this, I like to speak to financial experts on the ground in the country in question. It's been easy to speak to experts on the ground in China in making my Evergrande series, but because of the political situation in Turkey, anyone I've contacted has said that they don't feel they'd be safe if they had an honest conversation about the economy. They weren't even comfortable with the idea of an off-the-record conversation. Okay, so let's start with some background on Turkey and its economy. Turkey's a country with a proud history. The Anatolian Peninsula, which makes up most of modern Turkey, is one of the oldest permanently settled regions in the world. Modern-day Turkey was established in 1923, after the Turkish War of Independence, when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk became the republic's first president. He transformed the old religion-based constitutional monarchy into a parliamentary republic with a secular constitution, implementing social, political, and economic reforms. Turkey is a transcontinental country, it's located both in Asia and in Europe, and has a majority Muslim population. It's one of the most visited tourist destinations in the world, and it's notable as the only country in the world where they drink more tea than the Irish do. The United Kingdom only comes in at number four on the list, and that's because they classify PG tips as tea, which even the advertising makes clear is only suited for monkeys, but that's for another video. Turkey had a painful experience of high and chronic inflation over the period from 1975 through to 2004, caused by political instability, poor institutions, high public sector budget deficits, and depreciation of the Turkish lira which culminated in a severe financial crisis in 2000 and 2001. The establishment of an independent central bank in 2001, which focused mainly on fighting inflation, along with tight fiscal policies implemented at the same time, finally brought inflation under control. Starting in the early 2000s, an economic boom transformed Turkey into an upper-middle-income country. The poverty rate collapsed. Between 2002 and 2014, Turkey was even hoping to become a member of the European Union. While still classified as an emerging market, Turkey was seen as one of the most developed developing countries in the world. According to the IMF, in 2020, it was the 20th largest economy in the world by GDP. Now, a crackdown that came after an illegal coup attempt in 2016 damaged Turkey's relationship with the European Union. Turkish President Erdogan indicated his approval of reinstating the death penalty to punish those involved in the coup, with the EU suggesting that this would end the country's EU membership ambitions. The European Parliament temporarily suspended membership negotiations due to the disproportionate repressive measures of the government to the coup in November of 2016. As I mentioned earlier, Turkey's national currency has been in freefall. It's fallen 60% against the dollar year to date and is down 93% since 2008. The Turkish stock market is down 36% this year in dollar terms and down 61% over the last four years. On Thursday, after a widely expected interest rate cut, the Turkish lira fell 5%.
President Erdogan had announced his intention last month to lower rates, despite soaring inflation of more than 20%. This currency crash has hit Turkish citizens hard, with almost daily price increases and officially reported inflation rates of 21%. Analysts say that true inflation rates may be double that. Right after Thursday's rate cut, President Erdogan announced that he would be raising the minimum wage in the new year by 50%. In his speech, he described the increase as a historic pay boost for the country's workers, about 40% of whom earn the minimum wage. While this increase might sound good in lira terms, it represents a 27% decrease in pay for workers in dollar terms compared with the start of this year due to the collapsing currency. There is of course a feedback loop between inflation and wages. As the inflation rate increases, you have to increase the minimum wage. But then once you've increased the minimum wage, that creates more inflation. So it's all around problematic. So how is this affecting people in Turkey? Well, an inflationary environment is obviously very difficult for those on the lowest incomes and for retirees. The press is filled with stories of minimum wage workers and retirees struggling to afford food. Farmers are struggling too. Tomato prices, a key ingredient in Turkish food, are up 75% since last year, which you might think is good for farmers, but the cost of fertilizer, pesticides and fuel, all of which are imported, are up even more, meaning that farmers are struggling to break even. Small businesses and tradesmen are struggling too. It's hard to hike prices on your customers when they can barely afford to pay, but input prices are going up day by day. Bakeries in Turkey have started posting signs explaining their higher prices by listing surging costs of ingredients like flour, oil, and sesame seeds. Many small businesses don't know how they'll be able to keep their staff when the minimum wage rises. Exporters have been doing a bit better as they benefit from the low wages in Turkey and the rise of foreign currencies. Of course, a lot of these businesses have more than half of their customers in Turkey and that business is drying up. Bigger companies are better able to use financial instruments to hedge against rising input costs and currency fluctuations. Wealthier individuals with savings, seeing the value of their savings decline, began moving their savings into US dollars and euros, causing the currency to fall even more. Many people even turned towards cryptocurrencies until they were made illegal in April of this year. A lot of Turkish business people have debt in foreign currencies, and their income is in Turkish lira. This group have possibly been squeezed the most. Now, some analysts are claiming that Turkish authorities might be manipulating consumer price inflation data, a claim that the government do deny. Consumer prices and producer prices have tracked each other quite closely over the last 20 years. In the last year, producer prices have risen 46% when the Turkish CPI is showing 20% inflation. This disparity might be somewhat explained by businesses choosing to absorb some of the costs for fear of killing customer demand. If this is the case, though, it could be a warning sign that further consumer price rises are likely in the near future. So what's causing this? Well, there are a variety of things causing inflation in Turkey and putting pressure on the Turkish lira. We can start out with the simple explanation that as an importer of energy and intermediate goods, Turkey is exposed to inflationary pressures caused by a rise in energy prices and supply chain disruptions. These problems are being seen all around the world. Next up, we can point out that emerging market currencies have mostly performed badly against the dollar this year. The expectation that the US Federal Reserve will reduce its asset purchase programs means that capital that was chasing higher interest rates in developing countries is now being brought back home. This has led to an appreciation of the dollar against most emerging market currencies. None of these issues really explains the problem in Turkey, though. The simplest explanation for the extreme level of inflation being seen in Turkey and for the collapse of the Turkish lira is President Erdogan's unorthodox economic policy, 
of cutting interest rates during a period of high inflation, with the belief that this policy will boost Turkey's economic growth and export potential. Erdogan's unconventional economic theory is rooted in Islamic economics and Marxism. He has invoked Islamic precepts against usury and referred to interest on loans as the mother and father of all evil. He mostly blames foreign interference for rising prices and claims that lower interest rates lead to lower levels of inflation. This is the opposite of what most economists believe to be true. Erdogan argues that if the lira loses value against the dollar, Turkey's exports will simply become cheaper and foreign consumers will want to buy even more. While this idea does contain some truth, these gains come at a heavy price. Turkey is heavily dependent on imports, and as the lira depreciates, imported products cost more to buy. In recent months, Erdogan has cited China's economic transformation as evidence that his model would work. And while it's true that China devalued its currency in the 1980s and 90s, this devaluation was combined with a clearly defined industrial policy. It's not clear what industries Turkey is trying to promote with a weak currency. It's also not settled that this is even a winning policy for China. If a country could simply build an export-oriented economy by destroying their currency, Zimbabwe would be the world's factory today. There's a certain incoherence to Erdogan's ideas. Turkish authorities have spent billions of dollars defending the lira in recent weeks while simultaneously praising the virtues of a cheap currency. Erdogan increasingly looks like a gambler doubling down after each losing bet. While his core idea of lower interest rates defeating inflation makes no sense whatsoever, one slight positive is that his Islamic ideology has managed to keep government debt levels lower than they might otherwise be. Most of the problems in Turkey are tied to these low interest rates, which led to real estate malinvestment. The low interest rate policy led to a debt fueled construction boom, which collapsed in 2018. At its peak, the property development sector made up to 20% of Turkish GDP growth. Turkish property developers often funded their buildings with cheap loans in foreign currencies. At the end of 2016, nearly 90% of the credit in Turkish real estate companies came from loans in foreign currencies. The Istanbul Sapphire, one of the tallest buildings in Europe, was financed through US dollars. As the Turkish lira collapsed, those loans exploded. The construction boom peaked in 2014. 69 skyscrapers more than 100 meters tall were built in Istanbul alone since 2008. Many are still unoccupied. Up to half of the buyers of luxury properties were expected to be wealthy investors from Gulf countries, but that demand never materialized. The lack of demand, along with the rising costs for construction materials, caused many of these projects to stall. Much like in China, real estate speculation affected many ordinary Turks, who paid for new apartments up front off the plans. These new homes were never built as the developers ran out of money. Unlike Beijing, the Turkish government actually tries to keep the construction bubble inflated. In June 2020, the government banks were instructed to lower their interest rates for mortgage loans for new apartments to 7.68% per year and add a period of no payment for the first 12 months. During that same time, Turks could earn 10% interest in their savings accounts. So the banks were pushed to lend at 7.68% when they were paying their customers 10% interest rates. A crazy situation. While these efforts did move the real estate market, the number of homes that have never had an owner in Turkey have risen to over 1.5 million in the first quarter of 2021. This is a huge stockpile of property waiting to be sold. Aside from the local construction projects, there were also massive government construction projects like the Istanbul Grand Airport, the largest airport in the world, and a number of large bridges. The Osman Ghazi Bridge, for example, cost almost a billion dollars to build and guaranteed the operators 
40,000 cars per day at a toll of 30 euros plus tax per car. It's rare for 40,000 cars to ever cross the bridge in a day. The toll is very expensive in Turkey, especially because it's payable in euros and the lira has collapsed against the euro. The toll has since been cut to make it more affordable for Turks, with the government paying out the difference to the operators. One of the big problems with low interest rates is that they can lead to malinvestment like this. I mentioned at the start of this video that the Turkish economists I tried to speak to were unwilling to talk even off the record. There's a good reason for this. Since 2014, the year Erdogan became president, over 160,000 investigations were launched into people for insulting the president, and almost 13,000 people were convicted. People who insulted the president during a chat on a public bus would find themselves arrested at the next stop. The Human Freedom Index shows that in the past 10 years, the nation gradually lost much of its freedom. This loss of freedom is tragic, but also economically harmful. Moving away from democracy is shown to cost a country around 20% of its GDP in the long run. While older people are being more careful in Turkey, the most visible display of public dissent is amongst younger Turks on social media. A recent viral video in Turkey showed a mother praising the president to a reporter while her eight-year-old son contradicted her, pointing out his poor handling of recent disasters. Young Turkish people are not at all happy with the way things are going. One in five young people in Turkey is out of work. Turkey has the world's fourth highest rate of youths who are not employed in education or training, according to the OECD. Almost 9 million Turks born since the late 1990s will be eligible to vote in the next election in 2023, and that could spell trouble for Erdogan and his party, the AKP. So how might this crisis end? Well, normally investors look to a nation's central bank to keep inflation in check and to set interest rates. Turkey's president has repeatedly shown that if Turkey's central bankers and finance ministers won't do what he wants, he'll fire them and replace them with someone who will follow his directions. He's fired three central bankers in the last two years. In 2018, he even made his son-in-law the finance minister. With an election coming up in 18 months, Erdogan seems convinced that his growth strategy will enable the Turkish economy to grow out of its problems. Most economists, however, say a crash is more likely. For a country in crisis, Turkey's problems are not really that difficult to solve. It's not a total basket case economy like some emerging markets are. The country mostly just needs a sensible interest rate policy and an independent central bank. Turkey has a lot of positives. It has a diversified economy, growth is good, it has good demographics and an educated workforce. There are, of course, issues with corruption, but they're not as bad as in many emerging markets. Turkey still is a democracy where elections do matter, but whether Turkey will find a way out of this mess soon is unclear. There are elections scheduled for June 2023, and polls show that this time Erdogan may be defeated. Whether he would accept defeat is a difficult question with no clear answer. If the president continues to pursue a program of interest rate cuts, then the lira will fall further and prices will continue to rise. In those circumstances, the only way for Turks to defend their savings will be to turn to a currency outside of Erdogan's control. Unless he suddenly changes course, the most important question facing Turkey, a country with great potential, is how much longer the president will stay and how much damage he can do before leaving. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch my video on Evergrande and the Chinese economy next. Have a great day and see you soon. Bye.